Hello, BookTube. I read until dawn again, and this was something that I told myself I really needed not to do. <laughs> I did it anyway. <laughs> so I'm a little bit blurry-eyed this morning, and the, also the weather is a little blurry. It's it's uh, misty and rainy here in Boston. Uh, but I have a very early morning mail haul. I thought we'd go through it and see if it has any uh, perk-me-ups. <laughs> we'll start with this first one here. Uh, Ooh, all right. Well, I'm perked up already. <laughs> this is this is the Lost Platoon Going Dark by Monica McCartney. Look at that. Huh? <laughs> Look at that. So he's he took the time to make sure his ordinance was all oiled up and ready, but he couldn't find time to put a shirt on. <laughs> hmm. Uh, so let's, he's got to be a Navy SEAL of some kind. <laughs> uh, uh, after walking into a trap on a covert op in Russia, the men of a top secret SEAL Team 9 are presumed dead, not knowing whom they can trust, and with war hanging in the balance, the survivors must go dark and scatter across the globe. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that's the turbo charge I needed. Next one is from Grey Wolf Press. Could be some sort of hoity toit literary thing. <laughs> uh, let's see what we have here. Oh, it's small. Oh, oh, I actually have heard about this. Uh, this is, uh, the Grey Wolf has a series, The Art of uh, Whatever, and this is the latest one. This is coming out in January. It's by Maud Casey, and it's The Art of Mystery. Uh, the 14th volume in The Art of series conjures a ethereal subject, the idea of mystery in fiction. Mystery is not often discussed, apart from the genre, because, as Maud Casey says, it's not easy to talk about something that is whispered, that is a whispered invitation, a siren song, a flickering light in the distance. <laughs> Maud Casey seems to think it's not easy to talk about cliches. <laughs> Most people do it all the time. Uh, Casey reaches beyond the usual toolkit of fictional elements to ask the question, where does mystery reside in a work of fiction? Hmm. Uh, and she uh, examines things like Shirley Jackson, Paul Yoon, J.M. Cutsey, and others. So, no mystery authors. That's interesting. Uh, I'm always up for an unconventional take on these sorts of genre studies, so fine by me. I, uh, I'm trying to remember now off the top of my head how many of the uh, Art of series I have read. I don't think it's been them all. I don't think it's been anywhere near 14. Uh, okay. Uh, next one is something, a slim novel called Affections by Rodrigo Hasboon, a Bolivian novelist living in Houston. Rather nice looking thing. Uh, with a cover blurb from Jonathan Safran Foer saying, he is not a good writer, thank goodness, he is a great one. Uh, so who is he when he's at home? Uh, in 2007, he was selected by the Hay Festival as one of the best Latin American writers under the age of 39. And in 2010, he was named one of Granta's best young Spanish-language novelists. He's the author of a previous novel and a collection of short stories, two of which have been made into films. And he, his work has appeared in Granta, McSweeney's, Zoe Trope, All Story. Uh, he received an English Pen Award and has been published in 12 languages. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, so he's... Uh, He's been awarded over and over again for being a, a great novelist, and he's called a great novelist by uh, Jonathan Safran Foer, but from that biography, I'm, I'm gaining that he's written only one other book, that he's written two novels, and this thing is 50 pages long. So I'm, I'm curious, those of you, especially those of you who are in, you know, Bolivia, <laughs> or, I'm, I'm curious, those of you in, in, the, in the Spanish-language-speaking world, is, is he... A big deal? Is he is he well regarded? Is he well known? Uh, I think this is my first encounter with him in translating into English. And of course, uh, now I, I don't want to read him in English. Now that I now that I know that he has a reputation, I want to read him where he's at his best in his own language. Uh, or does he write? Uh, let's see. Let's find out. No, yeah, this is translated. So uh, now I want to I want to know if Simon Schuster can get me uh, the original. Oh well. Uh, we'll find out. <laughs> so we'll go on to the next one here. I, I didn't mention, I think this uh, this misty morning mail hall ends with two boxes. So, uh, oh wow. Okay, this is, 
Wow, no pub sheet, and this is not anything I requested. This is by James Hamilton Patterson. It's Blackbird, the history of an untouchable spy plane. Wow, it just it's just a, a, an air model history. Black and white photos. The whole nine yards. So you you are... He's the author of Empire of the Clouds, which I read and liked. Uh, the classic account of the golden age of aviation. He won a Whitbread Prize for his debut novel, Gerontius, he wrote that book? Good Lord, I read that too. Uh, his most recent book is Marked for Death, a history of aerial combat during World War I. I read that as well. Why didn't I know this guy's name? All right, so uh, so well, Gerontius I didn't much care for, but uh, the, but his, his two works of nonfiction I've loved. And this is, this is the sort of thing that usually leaves me dry, this uh, a, a book about one particular thing, whether it's a, a history of the Roman catapult or you know, the Rolls Royce or anything like that. But, uh, but an author with a proven track record for me, that, that, uh, evens the balance quite a bit. So, uh, all right, next we've got one of these vacuum pack things that you have to, uh, destroy in order to dispose of. Because <laughs> even once you've torn it open, it's still in this shrapnel, twisted shrapnel shape. You just have to, uh, dispose of it into its component parts. Uh. <laughs> okay. Another thing I did not request. This is by Pino Corias. It's called We'll Sleep When We're Old. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. I'm pretty sure I'm older than most people on BookTube. And I bet I sleep less than you do. According to Mass General, I do. <laughs> Let's see here. Like Fellini's classic film Eight and a Half mixed with Elmore Leonard's Get Shorty. A gorgeously wrought novel that explores the complicated life of a controversial Italian film producer who vanishes after a fire destroys his home. <coughs> Rome, present day. An extravagant, opulent world of fashionable parties, fancy cars, and powerful people in a constant dance of excess and intrigue. Oscar Martello, president of a film production company, is a self-made man. Despite his humble origins, he has managed to achieve unbelievable fame and success. He's also a cutthroat and ruthless visionary. And it's his home that's destroyed in the fire. Uh, so this is going to be... This comes out in mid-December. And Pino Corias currently lives and works in Rome. He was a special correspondent for La Stampa, one of the most prestigious newspapers in Italy, although they have never run a book review of mine. <laughs> if any of you know anybody at La Stampa, feel free to make inquiries. <laughs> Uh, he has also produced several successful investigative reports and fictional movies for Italian television. Wow, and, and he writes all the time. He writes he writes just all all the time. Great. Okay, so this is a novel uh, uh, about the Italian film industry. It sounds like okay. Very odd the things I get. All right, let's uh, let's move on. What is this next one? Early in the morning, Steve has a day planned with uh, topless weightlifters. Uh, oh, okay, all right, all right. This is the this is the second copy of Blackbird. Uh, no matter how much I like the author and his work, I only need one copy of the book. So if there's an aviation fan out there, especially a military aviation fan, sing out <laughs> because uh, I now have a copy to send you. No matter where in rural New Zealand you happen to live. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Let's move on. Uh, it's always strange to me when that happens because you always expect that the person in charge of mailing out the one copy to me is also the only person in charge of mailing out copies and therefore will know if they're mailing out a second copy but that's not the case you never know somebody in the mailroom can do it somebody in publicity can do it it, it all depends oh no oh goodness gracious <laughs> okay uh, this is from FSG. I, I didn't request it, of course. <laughs> it's, it comes out in early September. It is uh, the collected poetry of someone who just has no talent in any genre whatsoever, so I don't know what I'm going to do with this. It's bilingual, uh, which will be interesting on its own, and I've never read this author's poetry, so it might surprise me. And also, uh, you you got to give props where props are due. FSG, their poetry division is as vigorous as anything in the English-speaking world. It's just incredible. So uh, I, I definitely give them props for that. The, the, I, I get a lot of poetry from, from for our Strauss and Jero, uh, and it varies all across the spectrum, from well-known names to gambles to debuts, and that's, that's a huge thumbs up for a genre that needs it. 
uh, that need, needs it for, for popular mainstream wide scale exposure. That's, that's just fantastic that they're so dedicated to it. Uh, maybe not so fantastic in this particular case, but I'll, I'll live. <laughs> so, uh, oh, okay, great. All right, this is this comes out in in early September. This is the finished copy in paperback of a book that I think I've mentioned on this channel before, A Son Called Gabriel by Damien McNichol, uh, which I got an advanced copy of and read and very much liked. Uh, it's a, it's very sensitively done. Uh, just in a case that I didn't, or maybe since it was 50 videos ago, let's read about it again. Uh, this is a beautiful and deeply felt coming-of-age novel that follows young one young man's struggles with family secrets and the mysteries of his own heart. Gabriel Harkin is the eldest of four children in a working-class family in 1960s Northern Ireland. Uh, in his staunchly Catholic community, the strict rules of belief and behavior are clear, and his upbringing is marked by bullying by peers who prey on his gentle nature and constant battle to earn the love and respect of his father. As violence builds across the country, Gabriel must also face his own inner turmoil. He begins to suspect he's not like other boys, and tries desperately to lock away his feelings and his fears, even as he explores his burgeoning sexuality. As Gabriel confronts the confusion and isolation that have always marked his adolescence, he also learns that secrets, no matter how badly some may want to be buried, have a way of coming to light. Uh, and those of you who've read a lot of, uh, of stuff along these lines might think, well, okay, that's pretty predictable. Uh, uh, but the author does a fantastic job of it. The author does a fantastic job of... Uh, a perennial subject of fictional interest. What what do you do when you're growing up in a, in a militaristic, repressive culture and you start to realize that your very nature, the very nature of who you are, will make you a target for that culture? What do you do? You can't change your nature. What do you do? It's, you know, whether, whether the setting is Northern Ireland in the 1960s or, you know, uh, I don't know, Sicily in the 1960s, where, or, or, you know, the, uh, certain, certain cultures and cities of very macho South America in, in the, the pre-gay rights era. What do you do if it is unthinkable that you grow, that you are gay? What do you do? <laughs> uh, the only problem that I had, hang on a second. The only problem that I had with this book was uh, that the author skirts some of the very tragic and very real tactics that people in in Gabriel's position actually did use, which was to deny their nature. Which it it it, it I say I say now in the freedom of the twenty first century, in the freedom of two thousand seventeen in America, I say now, well, you can't deny your nature, but generations of young boys did deny their nature and young girls they 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 didn't think it was unthinkable that you deny your nature they thought their nature was evil they were taught to think that uh so i would have i would have liked a little more of of uh a little less attitudinal anachronism than is present in this book but it's done so sensitively that i i didn't mind at all and the portrait of uh gabriel's father is really really good <laughs> really intelligent there's no there's no talking down w with the portrait of his father so uh so actually in terms of uh conventional in, in contemporary gay fiction i strongly recommend it uh and then we'll move on to the boxes here uh although i'm i'm still in terms of contemporary gay fiction i'm still digesting a book that i just read yesterday a novel in verse a ya novel in verse called Vanilla, about two boys who've been in love forever. They've, they've been in love with each other forever, their whole lives. They're still very, very young, and they're on the cusp of becoming men. They're on the cusp of leaving home and high school and entering the broader world. I'm still, I'm still grappling with what I think about the book. For, uh, uh, the decision to make it a novel in verse, first of all, but also it's a fascinating subject. When you love someone, and you've loved them for years, and you're old shoes to each other, but time is changing you at different speeds, what do you do? You can't, you can't alter how fast time changes you. You can't change yourself artificially. Do you cling? Do you hold on? Do you evolve? 
Is there any hope for that? And if there isn't, is there any bad guy? I, oh, I'm, I'm still... <clears throat> it was a very intelligent novel. I'm, I'm in verse or not, YA or not, uh, Vanilla is a very, very intelligent novel. Once I have a verdict, I will I will be back. <laughs> but uh, what we got here? <gasps> oh... <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it's a Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition of Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Look at that. There's the front cover. And then it moves along to the back cover. Oh my, isn't that beautiful? As the French flaps and the deckel edges and, and in a lot of the Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition, the French flaps are put to use with further artwork. I have been born and broken i've been bent and broken but i hope i hope into a better shape with iconic scenes from the novel and then the back flap is the same i loved her against reason there's a figure on fire oh my very nice all right well uh so this this must come out in september yes okay this comes out in mid-september and uh <laughs> I've, I've mentioned on this channel that I uh, I commit the great sin, uh, the great literary sin of really not caring that much for Charles Dickens. I just, I think part of it is timing. If you get bit by the trollop bug before you really read Dick, uh, Dickens, then he's always going to seem less satisfying. Uh, and I think, by the same token, if you get bit by the Dickens bug first, then Trollope is going, it's going to seem less satisfying. I don't think there's room in this town for the both of them. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I am going to... I am going to give this an enormous try. An enormous try of goodwill. I'm going to wipe my mind clear and give this an enormous uh, new try. Because this is the prettiest edition of, of uh, Great Expectations that I'm ever likely to have. So, <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. All right. Uh, and then the last one. This is the last one for today. Good Lord, our first, our misty morning mail haul is already hugely long. Uh, let's find out what we have here. I confess, all of these latest mail hauls, I'm looking for one thing. <laughs> I'm looking for one thing. There's a, there's a new political biography that I am slated to review. And... My my editors. Uh, this, is a rare, this is a rare, rare instance where I didn't have the book. Most of my editors anywhere in the world don't have to send me the book that I am going to review for them next because I already have it. It's a it's a very nice perk. I get to tell my editors that I come with my own review copies. You don't need to waste postage. This is this was a rare, rare instance. One of the, the only times in like ten years where this has happened where I didn't have the book and. It hasn't come yet. I'm starting to think now that I should probably just do that editor a favor and request the book myself and just get a copy. I mean, there's not going to be any trouble doing that. And, uh, oh. Oh. It's an olive book to end our book haul. <laughs> oh. Oh, this is by the great Robert Service. Uh, and it is The Last of the Czars. In a finished copy. I don't know if I sent off, I've already sent off the advanced copy of this thing. This is Nicholas II and the Russian Revolution, uh, which I can I can almost guarantee you was not the original subtitle. Uh, but this is the year of all things Russian Revolution. In fact, I'm all things Russian. 2017 marks the centenary of, of the Russian Revolution, so it, it, publishers are flooding the market with Russian-related books of all kinds. Uh, and I, I actually thought that I sort of maxed out on them but no no according to a couple of my editors there's more hunger so i'm doing more russian stuff <laughs> so, including uh ann applebaum's book red famine about uh the the intentional starving of ukraine and i i love her work i'm very happy to be reviewing her i've never reviewed her before in print uh all right so this is this is uh nicholas the second in march 1917 nicholas the second the last czar of all the russias uh abdicated and the dynasty that had ruled over an empire for 300 years was forced from power by revolution now on the 100th anniversary of that revolution robert service an eminent historian of russia examines nicholas's life and thought from the months before his momentous abdication uh with his uh to his exile with his family and his death in july of 1918 i've heard they all survived 
<laughs> the story has been told many times, but Service's deep understanding of the period and his forensic examination of previously untapped sources, including the Tsar's diaries and recorded conversations, as well as the testimonies of official inquiry, shed remarkable new light on his troubled reign, also revealing the kind of Russia that Nicholas wanted to emerge from the Great War. Okay, well, you know, pub sheets have to say that sort of thing, but what was that phrase? Um, previously untapped sources is an utter fantasy. <laughs> that's, that's okay. I mean, pub, pub sheets have to say that, but there are no previously untapped sources if you can read Russian. So, uh, But it doesn't matter, because this is a case where the, the historian is so good that you're going to want to read the book, regardless of the you know the promises of the pub sheet he could he could write about the most well-trod ground in history and you wouldn't mind you'd want to do it you'd want to read him on it and this is the most well-trod ground in history so <laughs> so and it doesn't matter i uh i think i think that when i got the advanced copy of this i i sent it winging its way to uh to olive and never actually read it uh, I know that I haven't read it, I, and I don't. I don't think I read another advanced copy, so I will. I will gobble this right up. And this comes out. Did I say already? Yeah, this comes out in early September, uh, but it's not on my Russian rondelle. I'll review it for Open Letters Monthly, but that's all. Uh, all right, so there you go. <laughs> that is it. Wow. Oh, good lord, what a mess. <laughs> all right, so so we have uh, the last of the czars. We'll do a Steve book pyramid here. Uh, French poetry, bilingual French poetry. Then uh, two copies of Blackbird. So you military ordinance people out there, you sing out. You let me know. Uh, then A Son Called Gabriel. And uh, uh, this is the finished copy, and I got the advanced copy as well. So you gay fiction fans out there, sing out. <laughs> I have an extra copy. Then Great Expectations in a Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition. We'll Sleep When We're Old. <laughs> the Italian film industry. Uh, Affections about uh, by a Bolivian-born author who I want to hear about from you. Uh, the Art of Mystery, uh, which features no mystery novels. <laughs> Go figure. And last, but certainly not least, Going Dark, in which you're, you, you must not forget your Uzi, but shirts are optional. <laughs> Book two. I'm, I'm all jazzed up now, so I'm going out to run some errands, but I'll see you again today. Thank you very much. <laughs>